Well, good morning. It is good to be back. We missed being here last week, missed worshiping together with you, but I will admit the Florida weather was kind of nice. So, but it's always good to be gone every now and then to just remind us of uh, how good it is to be together and to worship as the family of Christ. And worship is what uh, Tim is going to talk about this morning. So as um, he continues our mission and vision sermon series. Um, and so as I was thinking about songs this morning, I was like, I want to try to find songs that really focus on more worshiping Christ and who he is and who God is. And so that's really what we're going to focus on, just worshiping him, celebrating him for who he is. So let's do that. Let's get started. Let's worship together. Let's sing a joyful noise. Doesn't have to be beautiful, just honest, authentic, and desiring to worship him for who he is. So let's stand together and worship Christ our Savior. From a 
give all, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. My name is Justin Walter. I'm one of the elders here at Waynesboro Grace, and so I'm going to be reading from Isaiah 42 this morning. Isaiah 42, verses 5 through 12. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness, I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, 
and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former, former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and those who dwell on them, let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voices. The settlements where Kadar inhabits, let the inhabitants of Selah sing aloud. Let them shout for joy from the tops of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. God, we thank you this morning for who you are, who, um, who, you, um, who you made us to be and who we can be in you. And just um, thank you for the reminder of, of, of your, your glory and, and what, what you have done and what you're doing. And uh, just um, thank you for the many ways that you provide for us, for providing for us with your word, for providing for our, our needs. And um, just ask that you would help us to keep that in mind this week as we go about the tasks you've given us to do as we, we seek to share the, the provisions that you have given to us and um, give them back to you uh, through, through your ministries and the, those that are in need. And we just ask each of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Justin. Well, let's stand continue worshiping together. Why will everything sing his praise? Why will the rocks cry out? Because he is worthy of it all. He's worthy of our praise all the time and every day. So let's sing it out to him now.
seated. Good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Josh Fretz. I am the director of youth here at Waynesboro Grace. I got a couple quick announcements. Uh, first, Friday, we're going bowling. Uh, so if you are interested, today is the last day to sign up. All the information is in these messages that Julie sends out. The sign up is in that message. So if you're interested in bowling, get signed up tonight. Or because I got a call tomorrow with our number. Okay, next uh, message. Soup was made yesterday. If you ordered soup and you're going to pick it up, Lexi will be downstairs in the kitchen for you to pick up. There are still seven quart jars that are extra if anybody is interested in chicken corn soup. Okay? Uh, but the real reason I'm up here is I have mentioned to you guys, Matt, go ahead and come on up here. Why? Uh, that I had a desire to go on a missions trip with the, with the church and with the teens. And so uh, I called in the professionals because I really don't know what I'm doing. And so Matt, uh, with Churches and Missions, Matt Robinson, is uh, going to tell you. Today he is going to give you a preview. We'll call it the trailer for our missions trip. All right? And so I'm going to turn this over to him and let him get you excited about this. Hi, guys. How are you today? It's good to be with you here at Grace Waynesboro. Uh, I'm a missionary with Churches and Missions. My family is with me today. Uh, my wife, Tiffany. We have my son, Noah. Another son, Titus, who just turned seven two days ago. And he told me to make sure you all know it's his birthday. So feel free to let him know. Now he's shamed by that. And I have Maggie beside me over there. And we are missionaries with Churches and Missions. And CIM's primary focus, the, the biggest job we do, is we coordinate and lead short-term missions trips in the United States and around the world. My wife and I, we usually do the United States, Appalachia, Northwest New Mexico, because we do it together as a family. Not very often do I go alone. So when we lead a missions trip, it's our unit of five. So we serve together, we live together. Every day over the summer, we see each other 24 hours a day practically. And this summer we actually have, well, from starting in two weeks from the end of the year, we have seven missions trips planned, probably a few more. And whenever Josh got a hold of me, he said, I want to go somewhere that you've been, we have some familiarity with, and somewhere that teenagers can serve at, and my heart automatically went to Southern West Virginia. Uh, Southern West Virginia, McDowell County is where we're going to be going. Uh, it's only about a six-hour drive away from here, and we're going to talk a little bit about why we're going to be going to McDowell County, West Virginia. I'll give you a little bit of a history about McDowell County. At one point in time, McDowell County was the wealthiest county in the United States. Let's be honest, when you think about wealth, how many of you don't think about West Virginia when you think about wealth? 
Yeah, I live in West Virginia, trust me. We do not usually equate the two together. And in the end, is there were more millionaires that lived in that county than anywhere else in the United States. That's New York, California. This was an area that had booming industry. Uh, here's a picture from Life Magazine of the downtown of the little uh, capital of the, the area called Welch. And it was called to be the next New York or a little Savannah. This was an area that was supposed to be booming with industry, with wealth, with prominence. But then things began to change. It was a county built on coal mining, and things began to go out of disfavor. So I want to share just a few statistics of why we do this area and why there's great need. The population of the county has dropped from over 100,000 residents to less than 18,000 residents today. It's less than a 80, 90-year period. There's been a huge drop. Median married income in the county is $24,000. That's one of the lowest in the country. As a matter of fact, this is the third poorest county in the United States. The average for American married couples is 54000 Unemployment rate frequently hovers at $20,000. The highest paying job in that county is right now the hospital. The second highest paying is coal mining. The third highest paying is to work at the Dollar General. So you see a discrepancy in the salary distribution in that area. And 80% plus of the people that are there under the age of 18 live under the poverty line. 100% of the kids in that county get free breakfast and free lunch through the school. There's not one kid that does not qualify for free lunch and free programming. Uh, also, it's one of the highest populations of single moms. Whenever we're in that area, it is extremely rare to see a husband-wife combination with kids. It is very, very rare. And it's also got the highest percentage of children that are overweight. The reason is because it's a USDA food desert. Almost everybody is on a food stamp program. So every one of the kids down there don't get regular meals. All they get is potato chips. They'll get soda. They don't get regular food. They don't get vegetables. They don't get fruit. And a majority of the kids, the only good food they do get is through a food bank program that we're going to be working with over the summer. It also has the highest percentage of drug-induced deaths nationally. A majority of the people down there that you will meet have some kind of drug addiction, mainly opioids. Opioids is the predominant thing there. There's also a tremendous amount of, of heroin use. There's meth making in the community. It's a tremendous place where there's a lot of drug abuse in that area. It also, according to the U.S. government, has the highest percentage of people nationally with behavioral health issues, namely depression. It's around 60-odd percent, according to the U.S. government, has a behavioral health issue in that county. It also has the lowest lifespan nationally in the United States. This is a county where the lifespan in this county is 13 years less than the average lifespan in the United States. It's the only county in the United States where the average lifespan is dropping. It is its only place in the United States where lifespan is dropping. So we decided to survey this area two years ago. So there's a lot of physical needs. There's a need for food, need for construction, need for all of these things here. But the mission, we just don't want to build houses or work on churches. We want to love on people. We want them to hear the gospel. We want them to hear the rescuing message of Jesus Christ to save them from their sins. So my wife and I, we stopped at a, a little convenience store that's built just for coal mine truckers. And we went in and talked with a guy named Tommy. Tommy was the guy who had lost his wife to opioid addiction. He's lost both his daughters to opioid addiction, and he has five granddaughters sleeping in the back of his convenience store, all of them in recliners. These are normal stories for the people that are in that community. And we sat down with Tommy, an old coal miner that's got the store, and I said, man, what could my mission, CIM, what could our teams bring to Macdow County? What could we bring? And usually we hear answers like, diapers or baby wipes or baby food or whatever it might be. And this was his answer. He said, can you bring hope to our county? He said, could you bring people that have joy to our county? Can you bring people that can bring us not just physical supplies to feed us today, but can you bring us something to give us light in this unending darkness? And I love that answer because you and I both know the hope of the world is Jesus Christ. We love taking missions teams to areas to do work in those communities. So here's some of the opportunities that you guys are going to be doing here with Grace Church Waynesboro. 
we'll usually start out with a community outreach event to pro, 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 promote what we're going to be doing in the community. We usually do like baby diapers or wipes, or we do like food, and there's bounce houses. We do it at a ministry center or in a park, and we do that. We get everybody in. We'll get 100, 200 people in, and while they're there, we begin to share the gospel with them, and we begin to invite them to our programs that week. If we have a five-day club or a vacation Bible school, or if we're doing evangelism on the street, we begin to promote those events as all of those people are there hearing the gospel. We then do some construction projects in the community. Sometimes it's as simple as painting a fence. Funny story on the fence. They told us this would be a two-hour job. It ended up being 800 yards of white picket fence that had not been painted in 30 years. How many of you know that takes a lot longer than two hours? This might be a job you all will finish if you all come down together because it's still waiting to be finished. And the, the joy of the, the trips in that area, when you think of missions trips, sometimes you think, man, I got to be super skilled. I got to be a carpenter, a contractor. This area, if you could paint, if you just love people, if you say, Jesus, I just want to serve you. There are jobs and tasks for every one of you. If you guys are super construction oriented, we work with a drug rehab center in that area that is focused on getting ladies off of drugs and into the gospel. This summer we took up 3,500 square feet of vinyl, uh, flooring and we put down a 3,500 uh, foot flooring, a vinyl plank flooring so the ladies now have a place to live that is away from the influence of the, the drugs that she, they've had in before, and almost every lady that's been in that center in the last nine months has received Christ as their Savior. They have a redemption story. You, you'll listen to them talk about what used to be, but then you see the light come on in their eyes as they talk about Jesus. One of the biggest things we do, though, is a vacation Bible school. Because in this county, so far as we've been able to recollect, there are not many gospel preaching churches. There are not many of them. Most of them tell you if you have enough money and you do all those things, you're okay. It's a very health kind of, wealth kind of thing. And it's just sad because the people have no hope. They're not used to hearing the name of your church. The name of your church is, is grace. They're not used to hearing a message of grace. So these are some of the things you guys are going to be doing. If you're interested in going on the trip, I'm going to be back with you guys in two weeks on January 22nd. After the morning worship, we're going to have an interest meeting. And then on that particular day, we'll show you some pictures of the area. We'll give you a few more details. We'll talk through everything. If you guys come to the interest meeting, that's all it is. It's just interest, meaning I'm intrigued. I want to hear a little bit more. I want to know a few more specifics of the trip. We would love to have you guys with that. There is no investment at that point in time other than just a little bit of your time that day. That's it, just an interest meeting. And I always put this up on the screen if any of you guys have any questions on a trip. Feel free to contact me. I do have our prayer cards and business cards, and I have a little bit of a flyer here uh, for you guys. You guys could get that on the way out of the door. So if any of you have any questions, you have any concerns, you have any worries, you kind of want to maybe get a little bit of uh, information before the trip, feel free to hit me up with that. Let me know. We would love to do that. Also, we are on Facebook, so you can look us up on social media. We regularly post updates on our trips. So maybe you guys are going to be booked whenever we're going to be going this summer. We always can have you guys maybe catch in on another trip sometime along the line to be able to go somewhere to serve Jesus uh, in the world. Look, we need servants, and I'm so grateful, and I'm excited that Josh asked me to be here to be with you guys, to be able to take you on a Christ-honoring, fun, short-term missions trip that's going to mean the world to people that are six hours away because we're bringing a message of hope from Grace Waynesburg to those people. Thank you guys for your time this morning. Thank you, Mr. Josh. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. All right. Just a reminder, 22nd. Okay, this is a, we'll say the youth is sponsoring this missions trip, but if you are interested in coming, we would love to have you come along, okay? Uh, there's nothing better than intergenerational worship, and there's nothing better than intergenerational work, and doing God's uh, work there is going to be amazing. So I'm super excited. Uh, I also told him that I'm going to just grow this until July, and then I will fit right in. Okay? Uh, Lexi is shaking her head no. Okay? Uh, but with that being said, remember the 22nd is just information. Uh, if you want any, if you have any other questions, uh, they will be here after the service, but Come out, get some information, talk to me if you want to talk to me about it. I am, I'm excited. Uh, children, you are now dismissed to quietly and orderly walk down to junior church. And the rest of you, stand up, shake somebody's hand, tell them you're glad to see them.
could begin making your way back to your seats. Um, so this morning was a first for me, and it's the, uh, it's the first time I've ever experienced what we all collectively were just a part of. So let me give you a little bit of a description of what I mean by that. Um, I have led student ministry trips. I have taken students to the inner city of Chicago. I have taken students to areas in Kentucky that probably have just about the exact same statistics as we just heard about this county in West Virginia. I have taken a busload of students down into Baja, California, which is technically Mexico, and have driven through Border Patrol where there were no guards, and the car we were following, who was our guide, just stuck his hand out the window and kept waving, and we go, okay, and we just hit the accelerator, and we're now in Mexico. Um, I have led students <laughs> and been a part of trips in all sorts of places. We have gone to inner city Philadelphia, where we have seen just as much drug use and opioid addiction and brokenness as what we just had described for us. Never until this morning have I been a dad thinking about his child going on one of those trips. It hits a little different. It hits a little different, but let me just say this, and I want to kind of throw my weight behind our youth staff and this opportunity. I think it's a tremendous one, and I would love nothing more, moms and dads, as one of you now, for us to prioritize the meeting on January 22nd to learn more information, and then to think through what summer calendars look like for our families, for our kiddos, maybe even for ourselves, because it will be a tremendously forming opportunity for us. There will be no question about it that this trip will be cross-cultural ministry. And what our students and what we may learn and how we may grow will be life-changing. And it will not just be us taking hope to them, it will be us growing as well. And so let's do everything we can two weeks from now to be there, to learn, and then let's continue thinking about what it looks like to engage, and that'll be good. So there's seven jars of soup that some of you can buy. Um, and then we're going to try to figure out how to like raise money for Josh to shave. And uh, we'll, we'll do something like that. Like maybe Seth can paint something that, it, you know, whatever. We'll just, we'll figure it out. Um, and we'll dedicate it in honor of Lexi, okay? Um, so, all right. Well, if you got your Bibles, grab them. Uh, we're going to be continuing this morning as we think about our mission and vision of a church as our church. And we began this last week, and it's been seven years since we've had an opportunity, well, not since we took the opportunity to really specifically think about the mission and vision of our church. And so those of you that were here seven years ago, I know that you remember every word I said back then. So this is just going to all feel like repetition for you, um, but we needed to just take some time and think about what is God commanded the local church to do? How do we see Waynesboro Grace joining God in his mission and then following? And so what we began last week was to try to get our minds wrapped around from the scriptures, what is the mission of God? And you heard a little bit about that as Justin read from Isaiah 42. And if you were here last week, and also here today, you might have been wondering, is that the same passage that was let, read last week? And it was. And it's going to be the same scripture passage read next week. And the one after that and the one at the end of the month. Because it is a great encapsulation of the mission of God. That I am the Lord, my glory I will give to no other. Last week we specifically thought about how God's mission is to glorify himself. By reconciling all things to himself. There will be a day when everything is reconciled and rightly ordered. 
in the entire universe. For those who have bent their knee to Jesus Christ, that will be in celebration of his grace and mercy. For those who have not, they will indeed also be reconciled. All things will be rightly ordered. And that's the idea of reconciliation there. It's not necessarily only peace. It's the right ordering. And there will come a day when all things are rightly ordered. As believers, we have the opportunity, the privilege, the responsibility, the command to go and share the good news of God's reconciliation in and through the person of Jesus Christ. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation because that's what God's about. So God's mission is to glorify himself by reconciling all things to himself. So following that, we understand our mission as a local church and really the mission of every local church to glorify God by being disciple-making disciples. And that acknowledges the mission of God to glorify himself, but also acknowledges the command of Jesus in Matthew 28 to go into all the world and make disciples and do so of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them. And so our mission as a local church is not any different than any other local church. It's to glorify God by being disciple-making disciples. What we want to begin to do this morning and what will continue, Lord willing, through the rest of the month is think through the four different parts of our vision of ministry. So the vision would be how do we how do we see the mission being accomplished? Like local churches are not trying to figure out what their mission is. It's been given to us. We have our marching orders from the commanding officer. We know what we're supposed to go and do. Well, the how can be fleshed out in some unique ways in and throughout the local church across the globe. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is glorify God by being disciple-making disciples. And so what we're going to look at this morning is Christ-centered worship. And so the other aspects, the complete statement of our mission is that our mission is to glorify God by being disciple-making disciples through Christ-centered worship, Christ-centered serving, Christ-centered relationships, and Christ-centered witness. And beginning today, we're going to take the next four weeks and look at each one of those in turn. And so this morning, we're going to look at worship. And what we'll do in our time together is try to understand from both the Old and the New Testament what the Scriptures say about worship. Unbelievers and believers are worshipers. And that's an important part of what we understand the scriptures to reveal about just humanity. But then also helps us understand how to engage. And perhaps even how to make sense of what it means for us as Christ followers to worship. So we're going to try to step into that and make some sense of that. If you were here with us last week, I read probably 30 if not 40 different passages of scripture. Because one of the things that we wanted to do, and one of the things we've been talking about in our Sunday morning Bible class together about how to study God's Word, is that we want to understand what we see in Scripture from the entire lens of Scripture. We could say we want to fact check our ideas about what Scripture says with Scripture itself. We're going to try to do so again here this morning. Not as many passages, but we're going to be looking at old and new to try to understand, again, the big arc of what the scriptures reveal from both the old and the new regarding worship and what it means for us to be Christ-centered worshipers. So that's what we're going to try to tackle this morning in the moments and minutes that we have. Before we go any further, would you join me and let's just go before the Lord and pray. God, we come now and we ask that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see. God, as we open your word, as we look at what you have said, God, we pray that you would help us to hear you. We ask that your spirit would would give insight and an illumination that the, the the lights would come on, that it would make sense to us. Maybe in ways that we've never thought of before. God, as we think about what it means to 
glorify you by being disciple-making disciples and to do so through Christ-centered worship. God, would you see fit and be gracious to us that we might know what it is that you have said. God, I pray that you would guard and guide my words, that they would be free from error and accurate to your word. God, help us to see more of who Jesus is, what he has done in our hearts, in our lives, the goodness of the gospel, and what it is that you call us to. And we pray this in his good name. Amen. Well, like last week, I I put together a handout for you because we're going to think in some big, broad strokes, but there's a lot of information we're going to try to get through. So rather than you trying to feverishly write all of it down, you've got an opportunity to just kind of jot some notes along the way. And so if you don't have one, there are some spares on the table in the back. Feel free to hop up and grab one. Um, But one of the things that your elder team has tried to do is give some definition to these ideas of Christ-centered worship and serving and relationships and witness. And we've tried to give some context and some explanation to it. And so our description or definition of Christ-centered worship really breaks down into two components. The first is a belief and a conviction of ours from the scriptures that all people, saved and unsaved, are created as Worshippers. Now, this is going to sound familiar, but yet might be a little distinct to what some uh, phrase you might have heard before. Like Chris Tomlin wrote a song about 20 years ago, you and I are made to worship. And he's not necessarily wrong, but I think a better, more full description of what the scriptures reveal to us is that you and I are actually made as worshipers. God just didn't create us to worship. He created us as worshipers. And what we see throughout the landscape of history as revealed in the word of God is the issue of worship. We're not going to look at it specifically this morning, but Isaiah 44. So two chapters after what Justin just read. There's a passage about the folly of idol worship. You should look at that sometime this week. It's it's captioned in your Bibles. It's set off with a little heading. It should say the folly of idolatry. Read about it. But what it reveals to us is that worship is a part of who we are. That we worship something. And I find this fascinating. I've got a book on my shelf that is entitled Sacred Matters. It's written by a secular psychologist, and it is a book that discusses worship in America. And what this author does is he outlines 10 or 11 different areas of life that are expressions of worship. And his thesis, and it's completely devoid of anything, anything to do with the Bible. Like, it is entirely godless in every sense of the word. But his thesis, his argument, is that Americans are worshipers. And you can see their worship when they gather in sanctuaries 100,000 strong to cheer on their teams. And you can see it when they travel to Graceland and bow before Elvis. And you can see it when they, and he walks through all sorts of these areas of life where worship is what's happening. So he writes this in his prelude. The overriding premise of his book is that Americans are even more, not less, religious than they think. And materials from a wide-ranging historical and cultural survey of the 20th century and the early years of the 21st century will prove that God and religious traditions are not necessary to see the truth of this premise. And I think he's right. You don't have to have the scriptures to know that people worship. What the scriptures do reveal to us is what's to be worshipped. Or rather, whom is to be worshipped. And so Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 1. 
And he writes this, beginning in verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools. He's writing about unbelievers here. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their heart, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and, you see it, worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is forever blessed or blessed forever. Amen. Paul in his description of unbelievers in Romans chapter 1 says the issue is a worship issue. Your elder team believes that all people saved and unsaved are created as worshipers. It's the really first point to even understanding what worship is. So let's go back to the beginning or close to it. Because we're going to see some things work themselves out throughout the landscape of the scriptures that bear similarity, if not the exact same idea on display from beginning all the way through almost the end of the New Testament. If we think about the interaction Eve had with the serpent while Adam is passively standing and just observing all of this take place. In verse 6 of Genesis 3, we are told, The woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise. And so she took of the fruit, and she ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he... Eight. We understand this to be the fall. We understand this to be the moment when Adam ate and disobeyed that all things in the created order became fractured because of Adam's sin. It didn't happen because of Eve's sin, although she did indeed sin. It happened because of Adam's sin. And there were consequences that then rippled through everything that God had made and declared had been very good that you and I still feel the effects of and are yet to be redeemed from. But it's interesting, if you look at the rationale that Eve used, that Moses writes for us, that God reveals to him, was her reasoning. It was good for food. That's like the one tree in a garden full of trees they had been given permission to eat. But this one, apparently, was better in her mind. It was a delight to the eyes. There was something about this fruit that looked more desirable than any of the other ones. And it was desire to make one wise. I don't know if you have Romans 1 verses 22 to 25 still open. You don't need to turn there if you do. But there's some things that we're going to see sketch themselves out. If we think about non-Christian worship. It would be the camp that I put Adam and Eve in at that moment in Genesis 3, verse 6. What we see in Romans chapter 1, verse 22 to 25 as well. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Eve reasoned the fruit was able to make one wise. And so they exchanged the truth of God for images, things that you see, that resembled created things. And God gave them over to the lusts and the impurity of their bodies, the flesh that we have. And there's this repetition in Paul's description in Romans 1 that fits with what we see revealed in Genesis 3 verse 6 regarding worship. How it comes about. The, the way in which we would find ourselves tempted to worship false things. But let's keep going. Let's go to 1 John 2.16 together. We see that threefold pattern repeated again. And we're given even more specific language to it. But there John writes, For all that is in the world, and there he interjects himself and says, The desires of the flesh... The desires of the eyes and pride and possession, some of your translations may say the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. Well, that fits with claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the truth of God for images resembling created things. 
And God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts and the impurity of their bodies. That fits with and seeing that the tree was desired for food and a delight to the eyes and able to make one wise. But we see it one other place as well in Matthew chapter 4. And this is not to say that Jesus was worshiping something else. It is to reflect on the manner in which temptation comes or the invitation to worship something other than the creator. And at its most basic root, that is what temptation is. It is an invitation to worship something other than the creator. That's what Eve was tempted with. That's what she reasoned with. That's what John says is of the world and not of the Father. It's what Paul writes about in Romans 1 that is happening when people worship the creature rather than the creator. So this is at the very heart of temptation, which is the invitation to worship something other than God. And it's exactly how Jesus was tempted. We're not going to read all of these verses together, but I do want us to reflect for a moment that the invitation, the temptation of Jesus in the desert to turn these rocks into bread was an invitation to give into his flesh. Lust of the flesh. The temptation when he was taken up to the holy city and set on the pinnacle of the temple. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written he will command his angels concerning you. I would submit to you is a temptation of pride. All right, Jesus, flex. You really command the angelic host? Let's prove it. Prove yourself as who you really say you are. So jump off, command the angels to come and get you. Let's see some demonstrations of this power you claim you have. I would submit to you the last way Jesus was tempted was in the lust of the eyes. All of these kingdoms can be yours if you just bow to me. You want all of that? You can have it. You just bow to me. So as we think about what worship is. And the temptation that we see repeated throughout all of the scriptures. At its heart, temptation is the invitation to worship something other than the creator, God. Now, what's amazing in this is that the apostle or the the author of Hebrews says that Jesus was tempted in every way that we are and yet was without sin. That he took on flesh and blood and he wrapped himself in our weaknesses and is able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. So we look at a passage like Matthew 4 and we might go, well, was Jesus ever tempted to steal a car? Well, probably not. Like, there was no cars back then? Was Jesus ever tempted to go to a website he wasn't supposed to? Uh, probably not. The internet hadn't been invented back then. But if we see temptation primarily being in a category sense, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, then Jesus was indeed tempted in which every way that you and I will find ourselves tempted. And so temptation will come and present itself as an invitation to worship the creature who may be yourself and not the creator. And it's going to happen in what your body desires and what your eyes desire or what your pride desires. And so... We believe that all people saved and unsaved are worshipers. So at the very heart of what we're doing as a church, as we think about God's mission to glorify himself by reconciling all things to himself, and as we think about the mission he's given us to glorify him by being Christ or disciple-making disciples, worship is at the very center of it. In every way, today amounts to part two 
of what we began last week in thinking about the glory of God and his mission in and throughout redemptive history. And that's going to give us some helpful tracks to be able to think about what does it mean to be a Christ-centered worshiper? What does it mean to follow Jesus by being a disciple-making disciple? What does it mean to acknowledge and to, to see temptation for what it is and to navigate those moments of temptation by drawing near to the throne of grace to find the grace and mercy that's promised to us as we do? What does it mean to be a Christ-centered worshiper? Well, as that definition continues, we believe that Christ-centered worshipers are committed to the truth of God's word. They seek to exalt Jesus in every aspect of their lives, and they gather regularly with other believers to worship our risen Lord corporately together. So when we talk about being a Christ-centered worshiper, we're talking about, first and foremost, a fundamental break from worshiping idols and the creature to acknowledging the truth about God and not rejecting it but acknowledging it and receiving the good news of the gospel and salvation through Jesus Christ and flowing from that should be a developing commitment to the truth of God's word, a developing desire to exalt Jesus in every aspect of our lives and a developing, a growing commitment to gather regularly with other believers to worship our risen Lord corporately together. So there's really two functional aspects here. As our commitment to the truth of God's word grows, we see that in some ways demonstrated by a lifestyle of worship and then a commitment to the gathering as worshipers. And it's interesting, as we think back to Romans, the Apostle Paul, having begun Romans chapter 1, discussing that the fact that um, unbelievers were worshiping, he moves throughout the rest of Romans from 2 to 11 to talk about salvation and God's grace and his mercy and how um, uh, you and I should respond to that and what's God's plan in that. And we get to Romans 12 where Paul says, therefore, in view of God's mercies, I urge you, brothers, to present your bodies as spiritual acts of worship. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. If we take the definition John gave us of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, if that's the pattern of the world that is not from the Father, do not be conformed any longer. Do not let the world continue squeezing you into its mold the way we did with Christmas cookie dough just a few short weeks ago. But be transformed. How do we find transformation? Well, through the renewing of our mind, through the word of God. And there's an expression, a twofold expression that comes out of that that's going to see itself be, key, be seen in a lifestyle commitment. That I want to exalt Jesus in every aspect of my life, whether I eat or drink in all that I do. I want to do all for the glory of God. The very most mundane things that we do day in and day out. I want to do all for the glory of God. And then a gathering and a commitment to gather. One scholar said this, and I think it's just really helpful, that worship is the category under which everything in our lives is ordered. Whatever we do, even if we're simply eating or drinking, what we say in business, in our homes, when we gather together, we are to do all for the glory of God. That is worship. And when we come together, we engage and worship collectively. So let's just try to see the connection between last week and God's mission to glorify himself by reconciling all things to himself and the mission that he's given the, the local church to glorify him by being disciple-making disciples with this idea of worship. 
It's that God alone is to be glorified. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other. And we join him in that. Not just in what we do for the hour and 15 minutes we're in this room together. That as a lifestyle that we live, that the very most mundane parts of our days are lived and for the glory of God. And then we're also gathering together to do so as well. So I want to think in two ways about what Christian worship is and is not. We're going to start with what it is not. And this will begin to blend a little bit the lifestyle and the gathering. So what Christian worship is not, it is not limited to a time or a place. Jesus met in John chapter 4, the woman at the well. And her question was one of worship. You guys, you Jews, say that on that mountain you're to worship. And the Samaritans say on this mountain we're to worship. Well, what's the answer? And Jesus just says, look, it, it's not about the location. We don't worship because we traveled to the Temple Mount. You can worship at the Temple Mount, having traveled to the Temple Mount. You can worship while traveling to the Temple Mount, but you do not have to go to the Temple Mount to worship. We don't have to pray with a certain posture at a certain time, on certain days, or for a specific number of times during a particular day. Worship is not limited to a time or a place. Worship is not a feeling. I really struggled with this when I was in college. I'd show up to chapel not really wanting to be there. But I'd show up to chapel wanting to kind of feel the tingles. You know what I'm talking about? Raise my hand. I don't feel anything. Put my hands down. Still don't feel anything. Look for my coffee. Have another bite of my donut. Like, it was was a me thing. Chapel leaders were great. Worship's not a feeling. Now, feelings aren't wrong. Feelings aren't bad. I hope you have feelings that get expressed when we gather together and during the week. Worship is not just simply a feeling. It's not what has been accomplished when you feel a particular way. So we have to be real mindful of that. Because you might eat or drink for the glory of God and not feel something tingly. Some of the places that I most often just feel the presence and pleasure of God or when I'm running, and I've got some music on, and in many ways, it's just me and him. That happens a whole lot more frequently than what takes place in this room, because I'm usually trying to think through, like, don't forget that point, and remember this transition, and oh, that person asked me to make this announcement, and I hadn't had that planned, and I got to, like, kind of store all of this stuff in there, and I don't want to get bumped, because it might all fly out. So, the feelings are great, but let's not define worship by the presence of a feeling, or say that we haven't somehow worshipped if there's been the absence. Worship is not only singing. This was something that happened, oh, I don't know, early 90s, kind of in and through when the modern worship movement really got its foothold in the mainstream of churches and kind of launched out and you had the worship wars. Are we going to sing hymns or not hymns? Are we going to do all these things? And, and, and everybody was just kind of all up in arms about it. And worship as singing became just common ways to describe it. Like, would you stand? We're going to worship. Well, was I not worshiping when I was sitting? Or when I shook my neighbor's hand? Or when scripture was being read? And it, So do we worship through singing? Absolutely. Do we only worship through singing? Not on your life. I really appreciate what Damien says, and he said it this morning, and he didn't know I was going to say this, and so it wasn't quite a test, but you passed the test. Would you stand as we continue worshiping? 
because we've already been doing it. And we did it when Justin read God's word and when Justin prayed. And then we're just continuing to worship. Because it's not just singing. We're commanded to sing. Sometimes we can make an idol out of singing and think that that's how and where and the means by which we worship. I would say worship is also not an unbreakable routine. I've really struggled with this at times in the past before. And it's kind of expressed itself in this way. Got to do my devotions so that I have a good day. Anybody ever thought that, felt like that? And then you wonder like, ah, oh, I didn't do my devotions. or Like the wheel's going to fall off on the car while I'm driving down the road. Like, like it, we, we boil our relationship with God down to a transactional engagement where like we, we feel good about the day if we feel like we've done our part. But if somehow something's happened where we haven't done our part, we're like, oh, is, is he going to smite me? And there's nothing further than the truth of the gospel. That God's pleasure in us is because of what Christ has done. Not because you prioritize drinking a cup of coffee and reading a chapter of Proverbs. Now, Drink up and read Proverbs. Like, that's not a bad way to start your day. But we got to be real careful that these things are ordered in the right way. And so this lifestyle of worshiping, and then as we gather as worshipers, is not limited to a time or a place. It is not only what happens in this room, beginning at 1030 and ending at 11 sometime before noon. It is not merely a feeling It is not just singing. It is not an unbreakable routine. So what are we trying to do when we gather? This is where we'll wrap up today. I would submit to you that when the local church gathers, when we, Waynesboro Grace, gather, here's what we're trying to do. We're gathering to exalt Jesus. We're gathering to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Beholding the Lord of glory is the means by which we are transformed from one degree of glory to the next. 2 Corinthians 3, I believe, verse 18. We behold Jesus. That's why we come. It's not the only time we should have been beholding Jesus. Our lifestyle as worshipers should be characterized by our waking moments, beholding Jesus, but that we gather and we do something collectively together that we can't do separately. And it's first and foremost, the exaltation of Jesus Christ. Secondly, we gather to be exhorted from the word of God. We gather to place ourselves under the authority of God's word to say that, God, we believe that you've spoken And it's in our best interest to draw near and listen. And so we come. We come to listen. All scripture is God-breathed and it is useful for training, for rebuking, for equipping. We come to be exhorted from the word of God. That double-edged, living and active sword that reveals to us what nothing else can. And we come to encourage one another. Because oftentimes, the day-to-day can be hard. The week-to-week can be hard. There are seasons of life that are tremendously difficult and hard. And we come to encourage one another. We come to not neglect The meeting together as just a few months ago we looked at in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24. That we follow the command of God through his word to gather and to encourage one another. To hold fast. To encourage one another that Jesus is indeed greater. To encourage one another. To pray for one another. To have the opportunity 
and the blessing and the privilege and the responsibility in one another's lives to step in either into the joyful moments and celebration and we rejoice with those who rejoice or in the really difficult moments and grief and sorrow and we weep with those who weep. But we don't do so alone. It's what this word fellowship means throughout the New Testament. That we've been bound to one another by our faith in Jesus Christ and he intends for us to be blessed by one another. And so we gather to encourage each other. Our mission is to glorify God by being disciple-making disciples. We believe that's first and foremostly accomplished through Christ-centered worship. As we behold him. And so would you stand as the teens and Jen and Damien lead us in doing just that. He who was before there was light. Walked across the pages of time. He who made every living thing, behold him. He who heard humanity's cry, left his throne to wake as a child. He became like the least of us, behold. Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, Lamb, the roaring lion, oh, be still and behold Him.
Pause for a moment to behold you. We worship you in song. We worship you in all that we do. And Lord, just draw us closer to you. Draw attention to all the ways that we worship you throughout the day. And highlight any areas in our life where we might be Worshiping something that is not you. And draw us back to be solely focused on you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful week. Thanks again for joining us. And be sure to check us out on the World Wide Web.